I'm Alex Michelson. This week, an issue is exclusive. Where do you see California going in the next six months, the next year? Where are we at? One-on-one -on -one with the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, on school reopenings, vaccine distributions, the recall, the future of the state, and more. Plus, insights and analysis from our panel of top California political reporters. John Myers of the LA Times, Emily Hoven of Cal Matters, and Alexi Kosif of the San Francisco Chronicle. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. This week, a busy week for the governor of California as he tries to address the two biggest issues in our state right now, school closures and vaccine distribution. This week, the governor signing the legislature's so-called Golden State Stimulus, a multi-billion dollar package that means $600 stimulus checks to millions of Californians and billions of dollars in grants for small businesses. He also continued to visit vaccination sites. He's visited so many recently, some reporters have referred to this as Vaxapalooza. We were with him last weekend as he toured federal mobile vaccination clinics in Inglewood and Boyle Heights aimed at vaccinating minority communities. At the time, California had vaccinated over 7 million people. Now we're well north of 8 million people. We spoke with the governor at the Boys and Girls Club that's part of the Ramona Gardens Public Housing Development. Here's our conversation. Uh, governor, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Um, how's it feel to be out again, to be out in, in the field? It's got to feel good. Yeah, because it's one thing to intellectualize vaccination numbers and data and trend lines, but to actually come close and to meet people who have been impacted, it reminds you what this thing's all about. It, behind every statistic, every data point, it's a human being, a real story, a real journey. And to be here at a public housing site and to see people that never imagined the state of California, federal government ever coming to their community makes you feel good. And speaking of that, the people that are most impacted by this, of course, are the Latino community in our state, African-Americans as well. On this day, you're focused on both of those groups. What is your bottom line message to those groups who historically have been hesitant in some cases uh, to seek help? Uh, we need to, uh, my personal message, you gotta, we gotta be held to a higher level of accountability. I, I, we're not performing as we should. We own that, not only as a state, but as a nation to do justice, begin, a year ago was around testing, now it's around vaccination. We're behind where we need to be. So what today's really about is acknowledgement of that and really trying to go in a granular way, not just rhetorical way, not saying we're trying, but I wanna see that we're doing it. Now, question is scale, because there's hundreds of projects like this that we've gotta do the same thing. And that's a question of vaccine availability, limited manufactured supply. Once we address that, then it's incumbent upon us to replicate this everywhere. And that issue of vaccine supply at the core of the issue of when do we get kids back in school as well. I know you're setting aside 10% of vaccines for teachers in this state, um, but what is, I've asked you this question before, but I'll ask it again. What is the biggest obstacle to getting kids back into schools? And do you think that every teacher needs to get vaccinated before kids go back to school? I agree with the CDC. I agree with Dr. Fauci. I agree with the President of the United States that that would be optimal. That would be ideal, but that should not be the limiting factor in terms of being able to get our youngest kids safely back into school. The data, the science bears out, we can do that. So I think, frankly, at this stage, there's nothing that's holding us back. It's a question now of leadership, demonstrable leadership, get it done. You're seeing places like Long Beach, they're starting to get it done. We can get it done. TK to two, three to six special needs, foster homeless kids. We could do this, we can do it safely. And as you noted, we are prioritizing our teachers, 75,000 vaccines a week. Already 35 counties are prioritizing teachers. This will provide more clarity, certainty in terms of the availability of supply. But you said it's an issue of leadership. You are the leader of the well, state. It's 1,050 school districts. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the state of California put out a plan in December. Right. We put up $6.6 .6 billion of additional funding, working with the legislator to get those dollars out. We've already provided three months of PPE, three months. We have a new school hub. We have more data, more accountability in terms of being able to be more accountable to those schools that are not safely reopened. And we're putting aside 75,000 doses of vaccine. At the end of the day, we can get this done. There's nothing that stops local districts right now, based on what the state has put out from safely reopening. And we want to just say this clear as we can. Our youngest kids, youngest court, need to get back into school. And young kids 
of young parents. Right. And those parents, especially single moms, desperately need that support. You know, this is happening at the same time where we're, there is this recall drive going. Now, most of that is funded, of course, by Republicans who are targeting a, a deep blue state. But there also is some angst with some Democrats who voted for you and are frustrated by the state of the state, frustrated on the pandemic response. What's your message to, to those people? Focusing every day, 7.3 million vaccines have been administered, uh, surpassing Israel. There's only six of the countries in the world that have administered more vaccines. We are literally administering more vaccines that we receive on a weekly basis. We've got surplus likes of which we haven't seen in some time that's allowed us to put $3.8 billion in a Golden State stimulus in the hands of 5.7 million vulnerable Californians, two and a half billion of grants to small businesses. So look, this state is on track to be at a completely different place in a few months, get our kids back into school. That's what I'm focused on exclusively. So what do you say specifically to the teachers unions that are concerned? that are petrified of going back into school and, and that are saying we don't feel safe. Uh, I deeply respect that, totally understand that concern and I recognize you can't teach without teachers. I have reverence for teachers. Totally respect their strong advocacy to demand, demand that we do this safely. And all I'm saying is we can do this safely. I'm more optimistic, not pessimistic about that based upon the data, based upon the facts, based upon the evidence around the rest of the world, based upon Dr. Fauci's own assertions, based upon our own health folks, based upon the fact we're setting aside 75,000 doses of vaccine, based on the fact we've given three months of free PPE, we'll do more than that. Based on the fact we have $6.6 .6 billion ready to go out to support that cost. And last question, you know, we've talked so often over the years and even before you were governor, I'm wondering about where we are at this moment in time. You said you see the, the bright lights at the end yeah. of the tunnel. Where, where do you see California going in the next six months, the next year? Where are we at? Well, we're in a remarkable place. I mean, the, the fact is, we still, Bloomberg came out with their innovation index. California is still number one. 2020, more venture capital in California than 2019. We had all these new IPOs in the state. We're running surpluses that allow me to say this. We have the highest reserves in California history. We're putting billions of dollars back in the pockets of the most vulnerable Californians. We've gotten 23,000 people off the street. They're homeless. We have tons of more work to do in that place. We have a housing strategy, housing plan. We lead the nation in low carbon green growth. I'm incredibly optimistic about this state. A few more months, get through this transition, get this behind us, and this state's ready to take off and dominate in terms of some of the most exciting and enlivening industries in this world and bring people together and address the issue of poverty once and for all. Yeah, and hopefully the next time we do this, we can do it without a mask on. <laughs> we may have a few more of these first, but then eventually, yeah. yes. All right, and Governor, vaccinated. great to see you. Thank you for taking time. We really appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Our thanks to Governor Newsom. Up next, what's really going on behind the scenes in the negotiations to reopen schools? We are talking teachers, and you see them right over here. Some of the top political reporters in all of California standing by to break down what's really going down on the issue of education and so much more. A reminder, you can log on to our website for so much more. Go to theissueisshow.com. Also send us an email, theissueis at foxtv.com. If you're on the go, you can download our show in podcast form. Just search for The Issue Is wherever you stream your podcasts. And our show is also available for free anytime on the streaming platform Tubi. Just search for The Issue Is to binge on past episodes. We'll be right back. It's a question now of leadership, demonstrable leadership. Get it done. Governor Newsom on our show just a few minutes ago. So what will it really take to get kids back in the classroom? This week, we've assembled some of the smartest and best connected reporters in all of California to help us answer that question and more. With us, John Myers, the Sacramento Bureau Chief for the Los Angeles Times, a journalist who's spent decades in the State House. He contributes to the Essential Politics email newsletter as well. Emily Hoven works for the nonprofit journalistic site Cal Matters. She writes the daily What Matters newsletter, which you can subscribe to for free. She's also fluent in French, which is impressive because I'm barely fluent in English. Alexei Kosef covers Sacramento for the San Francisco Chronicle. He was recently elected by fellow reporters as the president of the Sacramento Press Club. Congratulations on that. He's also the reporter that broke the French laundry story. More on that a little bit later on in the show. John, welcome back. Alexi, Emily, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Thank you so much. Great to be here. 
All right, John, as our returning champion, let's start with you. There are so many parents right now who want to know what's the real holdup when it comes to schools? What's really happening behind the scenes? I think, you know, uh, Alex, there, there are a couple of factors here. First of all, I mean, there's a there's a patchwork of schools that are open and not open, hybrid mode, full distance learning mode. The fundamental issue that we've had up until now has been the access of vaccine doses for teachers and school employees. That has had some movement moving forward. The governor has been rolling that out and promising that over the last week or so. But we still have this disagreement about what the conditions have to be in a community for more schools to open up. And we're really talking about elementary schools and maybe middle schools. High schools are kind of a different story about COVID susceptibility. The teachers unions and others have been insistent that they want counties in this red tier, the seven cases uh, per 100,000 people. The legislature's talked about the purple tier. The governor's talked about the purple tier. I don't know what else we can do here. And I do think there's some people in Sacramento who think that the governor, by moving forward on vaccines for educators, may just let it play out at this point, even though he continues to insist they are very close or some version of that phrase every time he's asked about it. Yeah, Emily, your newsletter pointed to reporting from your colleague at CalMatters, Laurel Rosendahl, about the power dynamic here. She says the California Teachers Association gave $10.7 million to the California Democratic Party, $5.6 million to legislative races, a $1 million for Governor Newsom. So that's the dynamic here, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, he risks alienating either one of his biggest supporters or alienating parents that could potentially vote against him if the recall qualifies for the ballot. So he has a lot of political balancing to do here. Alexi, sort of bottom line this for us. What's the timing look like and, and how, do you, how do we see this playing out? It's, it's still an open question at this point. The timeline that they're talking about at this moment uh, schools might still not even open until April. Uh, and some might not open altogether this year at all. So time is sort of running short. And despite their promises to try and get something done within the next few weeks, even if they do that, there's just not much of a runway for them to get kids back to school in this school year. And, and John, a lot of this points to some of the equity issues that are... are obvious in so many other areas because some of the wealthier areas already have kids back in school. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Alex is really kind of one of the fundamental things here is that California is a complicated place. The, the, it, it is not monolithic. There are a lot of changes here, but the question is, does there need to be a bigger statewide approach? And I will say respectfully to the governor, that he did not want a statewide approach for a long time and now has started to move toward a statewide approach. And I think the frustration there is, uh, you know, look where we are in the school year. People want to see some progress and they want to know that we're doing this based on science. We got to take a quick break, but still to come, will California voters tell Governor Newsom to get out and don't come back? Or will they say that to Trump supporting Republicans? We're talking the politics of recall and the story of the story behind that French laundry dinner that's dramatically changed California politics. More of the issue is after this. Back in November, a source sent me these exclusive photos of Governor Newsom dining at the French Laundry in Napa. After the story of the dinner was first reported by Alexi Kosif of the San Francisco Chronicle. Here's what the governor said at the time after Alexi's story was published. Instead of sitting down, uh, I should have stood up. After that incident, it had a profound impact on the push to recall the governor. Check out these numbers, reporting from the New York Times this week. Before the dinner, 55,000 Californians had signed the recall petition. Just one month after those photos surfaced, 500,000 Californians had signed. We are back with our panel now. John Myers of the LA Times, Emily Hoven of Cal Matters, and Alexi Kosef of the San Francisco Chronicle. Alexi. Can you talk to us for a moment about the story behind the story? What you first thought when you were first told about this and, and the impact it's had since? Yeah, well, you know, I certainly couldn't have imagined that it would turn out to be as big of a deal as it did. Um, you know, when I got the tip about this dinner, obviously it was uh, a very intriguing thing. It seemed like 
a, a, an example of him, you know, violating the spirit of, of those rules that he'd been asking everybody else to follow. Certainly watching it spiral so quickly into something more than that, into a rallying cry for people who found it to be symbolic of their greater frustrations with his approach to governing. Um, it took me by surprise. It crystallized the frustration that Californians had. It gave them something very demonstrably um, there in front of their faces. The dinner that the governor went to, the schools, the vaccination rollout. Governor's gotta be really careful over the next few weeks because he's got to show people that he's making things better or a recall election that probably will get on the ballot only gets more and more steam, the snowball effect. These things can happen very quickly. This is gonna be a really crucial time for this governor to navigate the politics of all of this. The governor doesn't say the word recall. He doesn't like to talk about it, but his media strategy has certainly changed in the last few weeks in a pretty profound way. Yeah, it has. I mean, for months he was giving these remote press conferences. People had to call in remotely to ask him questions. And then the past couple of weeks, he's been going on this mass vaccination, almost stadium tour, going to a different city or county almost every day, sometimes two in a day, taking directions, direct, taking questions directly from reporters, um, making public appearances. And I think, you know, even this past past week, his rhetoric has become very optimistic. He was saying, you know, oh, it's springtime, the vaccines are coming, and the things are in place that we need to ramp this up. Yeah, he's saying we don't only see light at the end of the tunnel, we see bright lights at the end of the tunnel seems to be his talking point. Uh, but Alexi, at the same time, you got these Republicans uh, who are out there as well. John Cox, Kevin Faulkner, both of them pressed on what are you going to do differently when it comes to schools and not really having an answer on that. And both of them also struggling with their support in the past for Donald Trump in a state that is very anti-Trump. Yeah, well, I think as the saying goes, it's much more difficult to govern than campaign. The, Gavin Newsom has certainly figured that that lesson. And I think that, you know, John Cox and Kevin Faulkner are stumbling their way through that, too, especially with an issue as as complicated and intractable as this school reopenings debate. You know, it's not like there's an obvious solution here. If there was, this issue would have been resolved already. So everybody is, is just trying to find their way through and, and sort of, you know, split hairs essentially to try and distance themselves from the governor and give, you know, a message they think will resonate more with the public. You know, we're all obsessed with politics, but apparently not everybody is. This week, Jimmy Kimmel Live's crew showed Californians pictures of Doug Emhoff, the second gentleman, Kamala Harris's husband. Even though he's from here, she's from here, they may not be as much of household names as you might imagine. Take a look. If I told you his name was Doug, would that ring a bell? Doug Peters. Is that Doug Jones? No, the only Doug I know is Dougie, Dougie Fresh. I mean. That's not Dougie Fresh. Yeah, I, have I to know. Say. Definitely saying. He has to come on The Issue Is so more people get to know who he is, right? <laughs> There's an open oh. invitation uh, for him uh, and for his wife as well. Coming up, we know this panel knows about politics, but do they know about pop culture? This week, we learned that Frasier is going to be rebooted, but it's not the only must-see TV show that's bringing friends back together. More on all of them next. We tried a saucy French chambermaid. No. <laughs> this week we learned that Frasier is coming back. Kelsey Grammer will reprise his iconic role for the Paramount Plus Network. It's part of a trend of shows coming back for a second run or maybe a third or fourth run. <laughs> Saved by the Bell, currently streaming on Peacock with the characters of Zach, Kelly, Slater, and Jesse all back with some younger ones for more time in Bayside. In recent years, Will and Grace and Karen and Jack returned for several more seasons on NBC after their iconic initial run. Patrick Stewart, by the way, reprising his role of Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek Picard, which is returning for a second season on Paramount+. Plus. The West Wing cast got back together for a special episode on HBO Max late last year, encouraging voting right before the election. And six friends are set to be there for each other at some point on HBO Max for a special episode. 
So sometimes these reunions work and sometimes they don't. Back with our panel, Alexi Kosef of the San Francisco Chronicle, Emily Hoven of Cal Matters, John Myers of the LA Times. Here is the question. Emily, let's start with you. What's one show you would really love to see be brought back? I would have to say Seinfeld. At the same time, I would be nervous if they came back because I would be afraid it wouldn't be as good. Uh, so it's a, it's a delicate balance. Like Emily, I just assume it's not going to be the same magic. So, you know, I was struggling with and um, my suggestion is going to be let's bring back Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Now she's a, a middle-aged witch and we follow her trials and tribulations with her own teenage magic children. And isn't there a show called Sabrina on Netflix now? I believe so, but my heart is with Melissa Joan Hart and those TGIF <laughs> days back in the 90s. Okay. John, your suggestion. Oh, man. Who knew I wasn't going to be talking politics? Well, I'm the old guy here. I'm going to pick, you know, is, there's the Aaron Sorkin theme. I'm going to pick Sports Night. I don't know how many people remember Ooh. Aaron Sorkin's show Sports Night. I was a huge fan of that. You'd have to tinker it some because of a variety of things with the cast. Joshua Molina, though, you know, was the crossover from the West Wing to Sports Night. Love that show. So I'm picking Sports Night. Okay, this is where we usually talk about the intersection of politics and pop culture, and that's certainly happening in a new Spotify podcast starring the bromance between Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen. I started to learn some Beatles stuff. I learned Twist and Shout. <laughs> Did your folks say anything? Keep it down. <laughs> the podcast series is called Renegades Born in the USA. So we end this week with music from the boss, Born in the USA. This is where our panel can show off their dancing skills, rock out. Our thanks to them, our thanks to Governor Newsom, but mostly thanks to you for watching The Issue Is. We'll see you next time. Let's see more of that move, Alexi. <laughs>